In this lesson, we will deal with the historical evolution of human rights. To sketch such evolution, we may highlight several mileposts. The struggle to limit political power is as old as the history of humankind, but it would not be until the low Middle Ages that limits to power would be expressed in binding commitments. Thus, in the 12th century Spain, with the Magna Carta for the Kingdom of Leon, 1188, and in the early 13th century England, with the British Magna Carta, 1215, the growing power of central kings was prevented from being arbitrarily used against their subjects through the enshrinement of due process of law and home privacy rights. Much later, in 1689, the King of England was forced to agree to the British Bill of Rights as a condition to occupy the throne. In the late 17th century, the British philosopher John Locke argued in favor of restricting the royal power, defending religious tolerance and the protection of the natural right to property. French political philosophers of the 18th century, such as Montesquieu and Rousseau, defended the division of state functions in order to limit power. During the same period, German philosopher Immanuel Kant made the case for bestowing rights to all rational beings in recognition of their natural dignity. On the political front, Liberal revolutions during the late 18th century also bolstered the cause of the protection of individual rights. Thus, after the success of the United States Revolution, the first set of amendments to the American Constitution in 1791 came in the shape of a Bill of Rights. Shortly after that, at the outset of the French Revolution, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen was issued by the revolutionaries in power. This trend is known as the positivization of human rights, that is, their translation into human-made law. Since the liberal revolutions of the late 18th century were inspired by rationalism, individual rights meant that all human beings were supposed to be entitled to them including slaves and women who had been traditionally excluded from full citizenship. Therefore, since the 19th century, human rights were progressively recognized for all people. By the mid 19th century, it was clear in Europe that the rights enshrined after the liberal revolutions would not suffice. Those rights refer to the limitation of power and the protection of the individual in its most intimate sphere. They also dealt with the participation of the individual in the social, economic and political life of the community, including the right to elect public officials and representatives and to run for public office. In a word, they were the rights of liberty, also known as first-generation rights or civil and political rights. But now the need was felt to recognize the rights of equality, to improve the material conditions of the poor and most vulnerable classes of society. The set of rights which aimed at having basic needs satisfied has been called in the last several decades the second generation of rights or economic, social and cultural rights. The state was now expected to deliver not just to keep its hands off. Although since the time of the Enlightenment, rationalism had made the case for the expansion of rights to all rational beings, it was only in 1948, after the Second World War, that the international community proclaimed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Thereafter, many other international human rights documents have been produced. They will be dealt with soon in a class of discourse devoted to them. Let's just point out now 
that historically it was the awareness of the universal vulnerability of humankind vis-a-vis -vis the horrors of warfare rather than a shared rationality, the reason which elevated human rights to an international dimension. Starting in the 1970s, a new wave of rights came up. These were civil and political, as well as economic, social and cultural rights. Yet, they were tailored to the needs of specific groups, such as women, children, disabled people and indigenous people. These groups are either objectively vulnerable, as in the case of disabled people or children, or they have been made vulnerable through a history of discrimination and exclusion, as in the case of women and indigenous people. Also, since the 1970s, some collective rights were proclaimed. For example, the right to peace, the right to development, and the right to a clean, sustainable environment. Except for the latter, they are included just in declarations, not in legally binding documents. Criminal law is the most powerful legal mechanism to protect rights and social values. Following some precedents, the international community decided to create in 1998 the first permanent international criminal court. International criminal law will be dealt with in a special class of this course. Another way of looking at the historical evolution of human rights is to pay attention to the obligor, or entity upon which human rights obligations have been imposed. Before the revolutions of the late 18th century, the one obliged to recognize and respect basic rights was the king or ruler. After the liberal revolutions of the late 18th century, the entity that was supposed to recognize and respect the rights of citizens was not the king anymore, but the modern nation state whose power is most evidently exercised by the government. Since the issuing of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and subsequent international treaties, it is not only the nation state, but the international community as well, especially the United Nations, the entities obliged to respect and promote human rights. As time passed, this rationale, where the obligor is the state or another political entity and the right holder is a private individual, has been completed by a trend towards accepting that the obligor may be another private entity, such as another individual, a corporation, or an armed group in times of war. This is known as the horizontal effect of human rights. As mentioned earlier, it is customary to talk about generations when analyzing the evolution of human rights. Accordingly, the first generation or first wave of rights would be that which protects the intimate sphere of the individuals, as does the right to life, to privacy, to security and the like. This first generation also comprises the right to participate in the political life of the community, including the election of representatives and running for public office. For some authors, political rights would constitute a second generation. Afterwards, due to the social revolutions of the mid-19th century Europe, a second generation or wave of rights came to the fore. It refers to material life conditions, including the rights to work, to health, to education and to social security. In the second half of the 20th century, a third generation of rights has been said to appear. For some, it is made of the specification of rights for certain groups. For others, it refers to collective rights. Although this terminology of generations has a certain didactic quality, it may also suggest 
the rather dangerous notion of a hierarchy of human rights. The point is that these generations of rights are intertwined and it is not possible to establish a hierarchy among them. For instance, the right to life, a first generation right, needs the adequate protection of the right to health, a second generation right, and of the right to an unpolluted environment, a third generation right, to be really fulfilled. Please visit our website mookchile.com. Also, we cordially invite you to watch the next class of this course.